This episode of Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by CastBox. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app where you can find all of your favorite podcasts, and it's available on both iOS and Android. You can listen to Sacred Symbols via whichever service you choose, of course, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot. We think they're pretty rad. To get each episode of Sacred Symbols three days before the public, completely ad-free, please consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Perks for support include not only getting the show early and ad-free, but you can also gain access to monthly exclusive podcasts, and supporting on Patreon is the only way to get your listener mail read on the air, and much more. Plus, supporting Sacred Symbols on Patreon also nets you perks for other Collins Last Stand shows automatically, including the Nostalgia and Retro Podcast Knockback, the YouTube series dedicated to gaming called SideQuest, and the eclectic interview podcast Fireside Chats. Thank you for your generosity, kindness, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and all things Collins Last Stand would not exist. But enough of that. On to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty. As always, I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Chris Reagan. Yes, it is me. Hello. How is your life? Uh, it's going all right. Yeah. Uh, just uh, very busy, which is a good thing, but it's also like, uh, I'm over it. Yeah, I understand 100% what you mean. We're recording this a few days before Thanksgiving, so for free feeds, for people that listen to the show free, we're not going to be able to wish you a happy Thanksgiving in a timely way, but we hope you had a good Thanksgiving. This is going out on Black Friday, so I'm sure some of you are out there. Maybe waiting in line for good deals if you're fucking insane. Look at this entitlement culture. Like, everybody's entitled to a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, maybe you're not. Maybe, I, maybe you're going to have a miserable Thanksgiving. I have no idea. I'm sure some of you will have a miserable Thanksgiving, but I hope that... Thanksgiving, I feel like, is predominantly miserable for a lot of people. Because it's a lot of people who really shouldn't be at the same table. Right. Like, constantly being shoved into the same table, and it's like, oh, man... This really shouldn't happen at all. That's a good point. It's the one time of year, I feel like, where families and friends... It's like the airing of grievances with yeah. Festivus, kind of, <laughs> although that's more Christmas-based on Seinfeld. But I understand completely what you mean. I'm not going home this Thanksgiving, which makes me sad. I usually don't go home on Thanksgiving, but I did go home on Thanksgiving, I think, the last two years. Yeah. And it's nice to see everybody, but yeah, it's also yeah. enough after a while, <laughs> you know? It's enough. I have actually haven't had too many bad Thanksgivings, but like I've heard from like endless swaths of people that it's like, yeah, it's really horrendously awkward. I'm like, what? That's like all new to me. I don't have that big of a family. Like on my dad's side, we have a pretty big family, but we're not close to them, the Moriartys. We're actually not really that close to the Moriarty side of the family compared to the Italian side of the family, my right. mom's side of the family. But it's much smaller. My mom just has two sisters. They're twins. And my grandparents, unfortunately, are deceased. And then between the two sisters, there's only three cousins and two oh, uncles. Wow. So That's a small... Yeah, like the four Moriarty children outnumber the cousins you know and we're all older than them and stuff so it's not huge there's not an incredible amount going on the wild card is that i have six nieces and nephews and that's that's where it gets a little a little crazier and i'm excited though because i'm going to see them in december do an early christmas thing and i'm going to get them some nice you know i bought them a ps3 one year a ps4 one year a switch one year so so you so you so you've run out of things to buy. Yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna buy them now. Uncle Collins uh, running out of ideas. Sick Alienware PC. Yeah, I'm gonna buy an Alienware. I would never buy a gaming PC ever, <laughs> except for the one that I use here at home. Now I bring up Thanksgiving just to say that for patrons that support us, obviously you can support the show and get it ad free in three days early on Patreon at Patreon.com/slash Collins Last Stand. And over five thousand of you, or more than five thousand of you, if I'm being grammatically correct. Do support us over there on Patreon, and we appreciate that very much. You will receive this in time for us to wish you a very happy and healthy Thanksgiving. Chris, mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about this anymore, but I'm going to say it one more time. We have moved feeds. This began with episode 19, I think. We're on episode 21 now. Mm -hmm. Almost everyone saw no difference except for people on Google. I put out uh, some emails and some feelers to try to get things fixed as the feed doesn't seem to work with Google's podcast app. It works with Google's music app. Oh, but weird. not with the podcast app. As I've been telling people on... This is occupying way too much of my time at this point because I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. So my answer is it'll be fixed for people that aren't, it isn't working for when it's fixed. I don't know what else I'm supposed to do about it. And it's available. The show of it is available on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher and TuneIn and CastBox, etc. You have many options. So I'm sorry for the few of you, few thousand of you that didn't get the shows uh, initially, but this is a Google-centric problem. I can't even log into the podcast portal for the last five days. I get... Like wow. a, a 500 error. That's insane. Yeah. That's broken. It's oh, it's totally broken. It's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't know what else I can possibly do for you guys, but I'm sorry. But I did send in a We've Moved podcast through the old feed 
so that people know what the hell is going on. Because I think that there's a few thousand people out there that think that the show just got canceled. <laughs> and that's not the case. Chris, you and I, before we started, just discussed our plans for the holiday. I'm going to go away in the middle of December for a little while. You're going at the end of December and into January. So as we said last week, we're going to record a few special interstitial episodes. So I think what we're going to do, and I just want to bring up the calendar just to let everyone know, to give them a little guided tour of the plan, is that there will be a normal episode, and I'm using Patreon publish dates. This is going to go live on November 20th. We'll have normal episodes on November 27th and and December 4th. December, what would it be? December 11th, we're going to probably do one of three special episodes. The three special episodes Chris and I are planning are the best moments of 2018, Mm -hmm. the best games of 2018 for PlayStation, and then our most anticipated games of 2019. One of those is going to go live on the 11th. We'll do a normal episode on the 18th. And then I think on the 25th and the 1st, so Christmas and New Year's, we will put up the Game of the Year episode that we will record early and the moments episode or the you know anticipated games episode so i just want to let everyone know we're not going to miss any weeks yeah sacred symbols will never miss <laughs> a week ever forever that's right forever and the red dead episode just went live for everyone as well so you can enjoy that do not listen to it until you have beaten the game yeah it's a very heavy spoiler cast <clears throat> finally chris the 15th november 15th which has already passed was playstation 4's fifth birthday and that's so crazy. i thought we would acknowledge that Five years? Five years. It feels somehow longer than that, but also not that long at the same time for some reason. I feel like it's just because like the generation, that like last generation was so weird and unusually long that like every generation past it seems like really like, oh, that was quick. Right. And we're going to talk yeah. about what, you know, the big story this week, which we're going to get into a minute, is that Sony's not at E3 in 2019 or announced that they won't, which has great implications of when the console will come out. Mm-hmm. But as I said, yeah, people that kind of grew up with the Xbox 360 and PS3, or that was their first foray into gaming, I think have an unrealistic expectation of how long generations last. And if it wasn't for the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, 2010, I guarantee you that the generation wouldn't have lasted as long. So that was an outlier for all of us. But Kenneth Ohms wrote into us on Patreon. And remember, if you support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, one of the perks is that you get to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas to our show like Kenneth did. And he said, hey, Colin and Chris, repeating what I posted after episode 20, Chris, one of the last driver games was set in the 70s and 80s and plays like a G- the GTA series and Scarface, The World is Yours, takes place in 1983 and plays like a mixture of the Mafia series with GTA Vice City. You should check them out. That does sound interesting. I, I never really got into the driver games. I didn't know what they were. I literally, I is it actually just you're a driver? Is that what the game is? I don't know. I well, Because that's what I assumed when I saw yeah. it. I was like, driver, I was like, oh, that sounds really not interesting at all to my child brain. Yeah, it's like, oh, let's see yeah, driver. <laughs> driver. It's a golf game, but where <laughs> all you do is drive the balls. You don't even have to play on the green at all. But that was written in for people that don't know because Chris and I were talking about in relation to an audience question about time periods that we didn't or do we don't get to explore in games. Chris had said the 70s, so Driver is an option for you. And we did note a few weeks ago when we talked about the best-selling overall PS1 games via NPD in North America that Driver was number 10 on yeah. that list. But I don't know anything about that series to be perfectly honest. It's got to be a good game though if it's like... I agree with you when I would see that. First of all, I wasn't really into racing games at all, but it sounded like a racing game to me. And I was like, well, I don't want to play that. So right. I guess I was wrong. Christian Ruiz wrote into us and said, hi, Colin and Chris, fellow fellow Chris here. Well, your name's Christian, but we're going to let that go. New patron. Thank you so much. Been listening to both of you for a while, but on to my question. I think in a podcast in the first week of August, you guys mentioned Evo, the fighting game tournament in Las Vegas, but didn't talk about results or anything beyond name. As someone who's a frequent player of fighting games, I feel that fighting games are a big part of PS4 culture because of tourneys use, uh, use it for the tournament, even though gamers are on all systems generally. My question, though, is would you consider talking about big tournaments, say Capcom Pro Tour, Tekken World Tour, etc.? Thank you for what you do. Love of the show. Chris, I brought this question up mm-hmm. because I want to remind people that on this show, we're going to talk about the things that are most appealing and interesting to us. I think in the news that we're going to touch on everything that's relevant to the wider audience, but Evo, I want to bring it up. We can talk about it. I respect it. I watch some of it every year because I find the Mm -hmm. competition so fascinating. But I just don't know that deeply enough. I feel like it would be kind of disingenuous for me to be like, yeah, let's talk about the Capcom Pro Tour or whatever it's called now. Yeah, yeah. Like we don't have particularly steep insights as as far as like fighting game statistics or like even like even esports people. Like I don't know. I don't know any like popular people playing fighting games. I, I barely know the people who are playing like the popular stuff now. Right, yeah. exactly. All I know is Ninja because I can't stop seeing him on feeds. Yeah, he, and he's on commercials, by the way. He's on TV commercials. Oh, my God. He was on Ellen. Was you he? see that? That was horrendous. Oh, did he teach her how to play Fortnite or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it was, oh, it was awful. <laughs> Epic must love this stuff. Yeah, you don't watch football, but there's... I've only seen it during football. It might be on during other stuff, but there's like a Google commercial or something for some phone where he's oh, the, in the, it. Yeah. 
and uh, it's like and it's like the mom saying like don't you want to meet ninja and like <laughs> i'm like oh man it's so funny that he got away with naming himself ninja and like that he actually owned that how many ninjas like username ninjas on game facts and mirc and all these things over the last 25 or 30 <laughs> years and he's the one that got to do it i was having a conversation ninja. with my roommates about this this exact thing except we were talking about like bands it's like the bands that break through it's like there was never a band called fun before that band called fun i guess not like i doubt that i i highly doubt that it's whoever has the biggest break with that name that then owns it i guess exactly chris let's get into what we're playing I want to talk to you about Fallout 76 because it seems like that's what you've been messing around with the most. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about it. It's uh, it's a mess. It's an impressive, beautiful, fun mess. Beautiful, you say? Yeah, it looks good mm. sometimes. Yeah. And then sometimes it's like, oh, that's a really impressive, you know, sunlight beam. Oh, neat god rays that are flying through this mountain that should not, that's not, <laughs> that's not how mountains work at all. And there's, like, glitches where if you look down at the ground, you can run, like, twice as fast because it's the speed is tied to the frame rate or something like that. And and uh, a lot of enemies, like, are upside down and, like, clipping through. The <laughs> That's good. Sounds it's, like a functional game. I heard the patch is bigger than the game itself. Which is yes, it is. It's definitely broken. And it's definitely... It's interesting because I think this game, it benefits from and whatever the deficits <laughs> from... <laughs> Coming out after Red Dead for me because it has a lot of survival mechanics. It's like, oh, you got to eat, you got to drink, you got to sleep, you got to do all these things that I think prior to me having played Red Dead, I would be like totally like, no, I'm done with this. But that stuff's engaging enough for me now after playing Red Dead that I'm like, okay, I can enjoy this a little bit. But simultaneously, it's an open world game that came out after Red Dead and it you can feel that. <laughs> I wouldn't say there's no fun to be had in it, because there is. It's fun to explore the map. The map is huge, and it's actually pretty dense with stuff to do, and like there's a lot of quests that are uh, you can find in terminals, and it's interesting. I actually like playing it alone more than I do with friends, which is like the opposite uh, that I thought would happen, but it's dated, and it's it's got problems. Well, we have an interesting letter here from Michael Lepper, who wrote into us on Patreon. It says, hey, Colin and Chris, Fallout 76 seems to be getting atrocious user reviews, currently sitting at 2.9 on Metacritic. I think it's even lower than that now. Although a lot of these scores are zeros, which is hardly justifiable. Yeah. Do you think players truly aren't enjoying the game, or do you think this is an overwhelming backlash to the idea of an online-centric Fallout game? Thank you guys for making Tuesdays great. Um, I'm curious what you think of this, because you said you're playing it alone, so I assume that you could theoretically play it as if it was Fallout 3 or Fallout 4. I mean, it's it's definitely missing a lot of the stuff that makes those games great, like a lot of the characters are gone, but personally, like, I've never really liked Bethesda's NPCs anyway, so for me, it's, I've always liked these text terminals because they remind me of, like, older games before they had NPCs that could read dialogue to you and give you quests. It feels kind of retro to me in that in that aspect, and I think a lot of people probably don't necessarily have that connection to it, so they probably view it as more of like a lazy kind of thing, which in fairness, I, I can't really argue that, but I don't think it's, it's backlash against the idea of a multiplayer Fallout game. I think that idea is pretty awesome. I think it really isn't just the execution and, and you know, Bethesda's horrendously dated engine, the fact that it, it really does feel like maybe pre-beta build like it doesn't feel like a finished game at all and i think that's what you're seeing i think a lot of people are on like a hate train with it like anything everybody's on like a hate train or a love train everybody adores the hell out of red dead right Come now everybody hates the train yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah and it there's really no middle ground if there is a middle ground it's just you're not talked about you know so it's either you're loved or you're hated i think it's more just the fact that people are seeing how broken the game is and and Seeing it justified as a $60 purchase is, is I think, yeah, I think it is a bit much. Yeah, it seems like maybe it needed a little more time in the oven. But I understand why they wanted to maybe not delay it. I don't know. Fallout 76 coming out in November with Rage, which is another Bethesda published game coming out in early 2019, might have been a conflict for them, especially releasing a game like this along with Anthem. We keep talking about Anthem in the Division, but that kind of time frame, I don't know if they could really punt it. And, you know, they want to hit holidays. They want to hit Black Friday. I am seeing, to be fair, people saying that this is not nearly as bad as people are saying it it's is. It's definitely not. <laughs> I think there's a lot of fun to be had in it, like I said. Like, it, it is enjoyable. The problem is it's just so unstable that those enjoyable moments don't really linger as as far as... They don't linger as much as the, oh, my God, I crashed again. Or, oh, my God, the frame rate's totally bonkers in this area. You know what I mean? It's just, like, a lot of little frustrations that kind of overshadow anything that's fun about it which sucks but 
That's really what the story is. Well, hopefully we'll see it supported, and I assume maybe it'll come down in price soon enough if people want to check it out. But I hope other people are out there are enjoying Fallout 76 as well. I got our, our we got our coach from Bethesda. I redeemed it, but I'm not entirely sure I'm going to play it anytime soon. And I think the reason for that is because I've been playing Spyro the Dragon. Oh, and you you didn't like Spyro back in the day, or you never played it? I or? did. I just messed around with it briefly. I really don't even have any recollection of playing it. How do you feel about it in current day? It's fine. Like I think it's fun. I'm like 88 percent completion through the first Spyro. So right. my one major thing, this is just a major Colin hang up, is it's not uncommon to have games with multiple platinum trophies in it, like Sly Cooper Collection, God yeah. of War Collection, all of them. But when you put in Spyro Collection, all three lists appear on your trophy list and you have to constantly delete the other two, like, you know, for two and three so it doesn't appear anymore. It's really an annoying oversight on That's their part. That's weird. But yeah, I don't know if it's just me, but I started, because I don't have any connection to the originals really at all. But I'd started playing the original Spyro and... I don't know what I'm doing or why I'm doing any of it. Like, there's no, there seems to be no story. Like, no. I'm go, like, I literally just, I turn it on. It's like Spyro. He's looking all cute. He's in this like hub world. He talks to this dragon or the, I don't know what he's doing. And then just starts. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. And then I'm just rescuing dragons. And I'm like, I don't really understand what the intent is. Like, what is Spyro even trying to do? But yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's a collect. It collect it's it fun. Collect -a it's easy. It's very easy. Have you, have you only been messing around with the first one? Yeah, I want to get a platinum in the first one. Right, and go from that's there. fair. That I, man, I, I touched. I did maybe fifteen percent of the first one. And I was like, nah, <laughs> it's missing too much. Like the, the second and third one, I think are, are where it shines because you, you have a lot more control over Spyro. There's particularly a move in the second one that I don't recall being in the first one when I was messing around with it, which is why I ditched it. Which is before you end a glide, you can do like a hop, and you can get a little bit of, right. And you can, there's a lot more control over platforming in that. Which is what frustrated me when I was playing the first one a little bit. I was like, nah. It's very rigid. Yeah, and it's one. finicky, too. By comparison. I'm not dying in combat, typically. I'm dying in, like, these jumps. Like, there's ju First of all, I get a little annoyed by design, game design, especially in a remade game where it's, like, it's a vertical game as well as a horizontal game, Spyro. So there looks like platforms where you can land on them, and then you just kind of, like, edge over and fall into water or something like that. And I'm like, but why yeah. would you design it to make it look like this? But I eventually realized that you can put in cheat codes to not... And it doesn't mess with the plat you know, the trophies at all. And I just used the 99 Life one because there was one part of the game where I died, like, 50 times trying to launch myself off this thing to get to this other thing, not realizing that I was just doing it wrong the whole time. But right. it's, you know, I'm just listening to podcasts and playing it. It's enjoyable. It's a collectathon. It's old and it feels old. It doesn't look old. It looks very pretty, mm -hmm. but I think it's fun. And, you know, maybe I'll go into two and three after that. I want to play some other games after, but I figured I'd give at least one of them a shot. But I am surprised by how sterile it is. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just I don't understand. <laughs> it's from another place in time for sure. It's a 20 year old game. But yeah. I don't understand what the intention is. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? Is it just, it almost is like, it comes from an era where we don't have to explain anything to you. And it comes from an era where you, you know, you just got to collect gems and eggs and all these things. You, yeah. you get it. And yeah. I'm like, okay, I, I, I <laughs> yeah, guess. It is, it is very gameplay oriented. I guess so. And Tetris Effect, I've just been messing around with a little bit more. We talked about it last week. Did you buy, you bought Tetris Effect. Yeah, and did. are you enjoying it? Yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's, uh, it's expensive. It is. It's forty it's, bucks. It's it way is. too expensive for what it is. It is I expensive. like Tetris though, like a lot. So it is. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for anything Tetris. I play. I used to play the Tetris Battle Facebook game. Oh, in like 2011 or 2010 or whatever the hell, back when Facebook was a thing. Is know? Facebook still a thing? I think. It is. I mean, it's. It seems like everyone hates it. What is a thing, really? Yeah. What is a thing? Yeah, for me, I think Facebook is just. It's just there. I go on it every day for some reason, but I don't really do anything on it. I don't think I've posted anything on it on my own page in many, many months, many. Actually, probably all year, come to think of it. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. So we've been playing Spyro, we've been playing Fallout 76, we've been playing Tetris Effect. Yeah, I, I'm a little surprised Tetris Effect is 40 bucks. Just a quick reminder, by the way, that Black Friday deals are going on on PSN and in real life. So if you're looking for hardware or software, look into those deals. A lot of good stuff there. PS Plus subscriptions are discounted, etc. So don't go paying full price now, you hear? Chris, let's get into the news. All righty. The big piece of news happened when you and I were about to record the Red Dead Redemption 2 spoiler cast, and we decided that while it's very big news, that we would just wait until this episode to do it, and I think we made the right choice. Number one, Sony has officially bowed out of E3 2019 and will have no presence whatsoever at or around the show, including no show floor booth and no press conference. 2019 will mark the first year Sony doesn't attend E3, which launched in 1995 and has been held every year since. 
In a statement provided to Game Informer, Sony said, quote, As the industry evolves, Sony Interactive Entertainment continues to look for inventive opportunities to engage the community. PlayStation fans mean the world to us, and we always want to innovate, think differently, and experiment with new ways to delight gamers. As a result, we have decided not to participate in E3 in 2019. We are exploring new and familiar ways to engage our community in 2019 and can't wait to share our plans with you, end quote. When Game Informer prodded Sony for further information, including if it would be off-site nearby or something concurrent to the show, kind of like EA does, they said, quote, we will not activate or hold a press conference around E3, end hmm. quote. Now, I have a lot of questions from the audience, but before we even get into them, I don't know if we'll even get into all of them. Because, by the way, a million people wrote in about this, and I did my best to select the questions that were most pertinent to our well, it's a big discussion. A lot of you guys were asking the same questions, to be perfectly honest. So I tried to be fair and spread mm -hmm. it around a little bit. But what? how does this strike you? This is a huge deal. This is a significant deal because it not only reads into the future of PlayStation 5, but it reads into the future of E3 itself. Yeah. And so I think there's two things to talk about here. Yeah, there's quite a bit. Uh, I don't know. I'm sad. <laughs> I'm sad because I like E3. It's like the one thing that I have that's like comparable to the Super Bowl for a lot of people. Like I throw a party and like I gather a bunch of my friends who are like all into this stuff and we sit and we watch and we like laugh at, at the ridiculous cringe moments and we like get excited for stuff. And it's it's a nice little uh, kind of environment that I've built around it uh, that, I don't know, it sucks. I understand it. I understand why it's completely dated and why it's going away and why we're probably just going to get really mundane directs that aren't nearly as interesting or exciting. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, Brody Rainey wrote into us on Patreon like you can and said, Hello, Colin and Chris. Doom game of the 21st century. I was actually thrilled to hear that Sony has no plans to be at E3 in 2019. While it likely points to an independent press conference reveal for the PlayStation 5, I think this move also signifies a larger change in the gaming medium that you've long prophesized. And he's talking about me. Big gaming websites are on their way out. It's no longer relevant or necessary to spend millions of marketing dollars on large conferences stuffed with gaming journalists. Companies can use modern platforms like YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook to control their message directly to the consumer. I think this is a great move for Sony, and I've long wanted to see a cringe-infested conferences of E3 come to an end. This is what Chris was just saying, although the memes afterwards were always spicy. What do you guys think? What purpose do these conferences serve if they're no longer going to become avenues for larger announcements? Well, I think that this is where things get interesting because I've said for years, listen, my first E3 was 2004. A lot of people have issue with what I say about this because now the E3 is open to the public and people are like, well, more people than ever go to E3 and stuff. And I'm like, more people go to E3 now than ever because they've let the public in because there are fewer game companies there than ever. Mm -hmm. The first E3 I went to in 2004 was fucking huge. And... It was so huge that, you know, there's, what is it, North Hall and West Hall or South Hall and West Hall, something like that, in the conference, you know, or convention center in Los Angeles. But there was, like, marketers and publishers and indie games and all this kind of stuff in a place called Kensha Hall and in these other little avenues and rooms. And slowly, slowly, slowly that is truncated to where those two big halls are not even totally full anymore. And for people that don't know, PlayStation takes up, like a third of one of those halls. So I have yeah. no idea what they're going to do or if they're going to pay for that space and just hold it or what they're going to do. But I do really believe that this is a harbinger of things to come for E3 because Nintendo has already kind of shown a propensity to pull in and out at its convenience. EA doesn't want anything to do with it really anymore in terms of being on the show floor. They just go off site because it's probably cheaper and easier for them to control their message. And E3 is a relic of the magazine and early website era. It's not a relic of the social media, Twitch, YouTube era, podcasting era. And so right. I'm kind of in agreement with Brody where I think this is great. And I don't, but, but, yeah. and this is a big, but I don't think this is permanent. I think Sony intends on coming back to E3 in 2020. And I think that what they're doing is basically saying, we have nothing else for PS4 other than what you know about. Yeah. And so maybe at the game awards, they'll reveal something. Maybe there'll be some release date teases, but you know, we're getting dreams. You know, we're getting death stranding. You know, we're getting ghost of Tsushima. You know, you're getting the last of us. That's enough. We have nothing else to say about those games in any major way. We're not ready to talk about the new console. And so there's no reason for us to be at E3. I think it's a wily move that I think actually puts a lot of the onus on Microsoft to perform. So I think that there's that extra kind of hanging thread there. But I'm in agreement that I think that this is exciting. I don't think that there's anything really, you know, uninteresting about this. And it allows us, by the way, to focus on the third parties a lot more at E3, which will be fun too. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, think about think about it this way, Chris. What did you miss? Or what would you have missed if that E3 press conference for Sony didn't happen last year? Nothing. You would have missed nothing. So it's just going to be the same thing without you having to sit there through that again. Yeah, that's that's true. But we had a, I don't know, I had a blast laughing at it <laughs> with, a, with a room full of people. Flute guy? Yeah, it was fun. Like, there's a friend of mine, Lyle, he, he does some, uh, he does a video series for Destructoid. And they had a... Uh, <laughs> they had a they showed a, a Kingdom Hearts trailer with 
that horrendous mixing where it's just like the soundtrack and then the voices and no other foley whatsoever. And the whole room like died laughing. And it was like, I don't know, I'm going to miss that kind of stuff if it ever goes away. Because then we're just going to have like what these really processed, edit, heavily edited directs from now on. Which I don't know, like you said, they're probably going to come back for 2020. I'd imagine that that's the case. Because uh, I, still, I still think E3 is pretty huge. I think it's going to take a few years for it to peter out. But if we ever get to that point, I think we will, where we're going to ha- just have like Nintendo style directs where it's just like heavily edited messages to the consumer. I think that's it's effective, but it's not nearly as entertaining. Right. I think that, yeah, we're making assumptions about what their future intent is. Now, Sony's E3 presence has vacillated over time. They used to do their press conference, for instance, at a huge arena. They don't do that anymore. They moved the press conference into a a smaller and more intimate thing. And I think that they kind of learned their lesson. A lot of people were really hard on them, including me, during E3, because I thought that their E3 press conference was frankly stupid. Oh, this one? Yeah, the last one. Oh, yeah, it was horrendous. It was a nice idea, I guess, but it was just not well executed. It was boring, especially in comparison to Microsoft. And with Microsoft's, you know, thing in Brazil or Mexico, I think it was actually Mexico. Or was it Brazil? Something down in Central or South America. I forget. Recently? like Yeah, the XO18. Yeah. I think that was in Mexico, actually. Yeah. But they keep performing. So I think that Sony is either planning on going quiet and then coming out with a big bang, which I think is exactly what's going to happen. And I also think that it gives them the advantage of letting their opponent go first, which is something that actually didn't happen the first time. Sony went first and Microsoft was able to react and adapt and not very well to the announcement. PS4 was announced in January or February of 2013. And in May of 2013 is when Xbox One was revealed. That's true. So now we're going to get a situation where Sony can just sit back and relax. And technically, they won't be going first because we already know Microsoft came out first about the fact that they were working on a, the next gen system in the first place. Sure, but I'm more talking about that's true. But I'm talking about a reveal, what the console is. The, right. I think that we're going to see that from Microsoft first, and that it's going to probably come out first. I wouldn't even be that blown away if maybe even the new Xbox came out in the fall of next year. Mm. And it was some sort of, you know, hybrid device, not hybrid device like Nintendo, but hybrid device that was basically an, a kind of a half step between Xbox One and maybe another console. Maybe they keep iterating. I think all signs do point to a 2020 release for PlayStation 5 and maybe even a late 2019 reveal for it or early 2020. I don't know. I could see it being revealed around like the holidays, around the Game Awards. Next year? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Or maybe or probably February like they did with the PS4. Right. So, yeah, I don't think we're going to see anything for at least a year from it. But... Tom Cargill wrote into us and said, hey, Colin and Chris, now that it has been revealed that PlayStation will not be at E3 2019, do you think it's heavily suggested, it does heavily suggest that they will reveal PS5 next year, perhaps waiting for PSX and having it as a huge event to reveal it alongside all their other launch titles? PSX is the great hanging chad for me because there was no PlayStation experience this year, yeah. no E3 conference, no major blow up at Paris Games Week, no major blow up at Gamescom. They're not doing anything. They're totally quiet. And it's actually becoming, in my mind, quite riveting Mm -hmm. because this is a risk reward situation that they find themselves in. And actually, PlayStation Experience, traditionally held in the last month of the year, could be the reveal spot for PlayStation 5. They might not do a one off because when they did the one off announcement in New York City for PS4, PSX didn't exist yet. It was still two years away. So this could be a way for them to make that an incredibly relevant show in December of next year come out with the console, the controller, the launch library, the exclusives. They have basically yeah. their own E3. I think so. I mean, I think that that's probably a safe bet. So I think that Tom has some good insight there because I think PSX is not gone forever either. I think that Sony's strategy is simply to say like, our games are selling, our games are good. PS4 is going to pass 100 million sold. We have, with the exception of Red Dead, arguably the two games of the year with God of War and Spider-Man. We're going to have all of these great first-party games next year, including a probable Game of the Year contender in The Last of Us. We don't really need to do anything. Why shake, rattle, and roll when you don't need to really do anything? I can, I'm can. i kind of sympathetic to that. The optical game is only important to a segment of the internet, but not That's to true. the people that are playing the games and buying the games. It doesn't seem to matter to them. Yeah, I am curious, though. Like, it is interesting that they... Because last year, their E3 was like... You had a decent amount of new stuff, and then this year's E3 was very, very repetitive. It was the same stuff that we saw last year, and this year they're not showing anything. It is, it does. I'm starting to feel like, is there anything even really going on? It does get the sense that it's like, are you doing anything? It's, I, I'm sure they are, but like, the, it feels like what's what's happening here. It, it is true that it could go the other direction. That they're so out of sorts behind the scenes that they literally just don't have anything to show. But I just, I find that hard to believe. Yeah. 
I'm I sure think, they have stuff to show, but yeah. like between the the update to the the username thing and like all these like little micro snafus, I feel like there's a lot of weird stuff going on at Sony. I feel more interested in what their strategy, their forward-facing strategy is in a smaller way. Like E3 is awesome, PSX is awesome. These are great distractions for us, but mm. I'm even noticing on PlayStation Blog, you, you know, PlayStation Blog is kind of a shadow of its former self when you look at it five, six, seven years ago when there were constant posts on there where they were revealing all sorts of interesting stuff and having interesting interviews. It seems like PlayStation Blog is kind of an afterthought at this point. Their whole marketing strategy seems to have shifted in a great way. Well, yeah, I think I think the advent of content creators is, is a big thing because, like, why make your own content covering the games when you could just, like, reveal something with text or, like, put out a trailer and then... Millions of people are talking about it anyway. There's a lot of independent games news kind of people on YouTube now who can do that stuff for you. Right, but it also does conflict with this idea that they want to control the message, but they don't. I don't know. It's hard for me to know. That's the thing. It's like, what's what's the strategy? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm confident. I don't know. I'm it's, interested. I'm interested too. Maybe confidence is the wrong word. Interested for sure. Because we did say not too long ago that, and I said it to you, I don't know if you agreed, I don't think you did actually, that I feel like Sony is setting itself up for a big stumble here. I, I, I don't know anything that would indicate that that's true. The things that I do know indicate that that's not true actually. Yeah. But I see a very resurgent opponent in Microsoft making lots of moves and building excitement towards something. Now, building excitement towards something only matters if you were able to deliver on that, and so that could easily blow up in Microsoft's face as opposed to Sony not building up anything, and then they basically win by just showing them anything or showing us anything at all. I don't know. Yeah. It's very interesting to speculate, but I think that this is a two-pronged thing because I think that this reads into the health of E3. And anyone, by the way, I'm just going to repeat it. I've been to almost every E3 since 2004. E3 is a fucking shadow of itself compared to the way it used to be. It just straight up is. It just straight up 100% is. For anyone that went back in the PS2 or PS3 area, you know that already. So saying like the numbers are up and more people are going than ever, yeah, because you're allowed in now. That wasn't the case. Didn't you they had... used to be allowed in though? No, you were, you had to have a media badge that was the lowest rung, and almost anyone can get one if you just tried. But yeah. a lot of people wouldn't. Like if you had a YouTube channel or a blog, you can go. And then there are exhibitor badges and all that kind of stuff. But no, I think it's only been the last two or three years that the public has been allowed, and they're letting more and more people in. And I think that that's to kind of compensate for less interest. I have no interest in going to E3 at all. Like I, I just have no interest in being there at all. Yeah. And I, I don't really have an interest in going. Yeah. I do have an interest in watching this the show with a group of people who are just going to get drunk and have a good time watching uh, Yarny <laughs> shaking. Did you? <laughs> Yarny is my guy. Yeah, that, I felt bad for that guy because he was like shaking. Yeah, <laughs> I felt scared. bad too, but I, I also was cracking up. It was funny. Substance104 wrote into us and said, Dear Colin and Chris, greetings. With the news of Sony skipping E3 2019, is there a chance PS5 will release in the fall of 2019? Or do you think it's going to be 2020? Would it not be better if Sony gains a one-year lead over Microsoft's next Xbox? Thank you for making the number one PlayStation podcast. Cheers. Thank you for your question, Substance104. It's a very mysterious name. Yeah. Now, I was of the mind for a long time that 2019 was the release window. And what I heard and based on some of the things I knew, I think that that was a possibility. Remembering, of course, that PS3 was theoretically going to be ready in 2005 and didn't come out until 2006. So I think we're in a similar situation. I think 2020 is pretty much a lock. And I think the reason that they might have pushed it, if they did ever push it, or if that was ever their intent to release it earlier, is because PS4 is doing so well that there's literally no reason to interrupt its flow. Like, if people are still buying PS4s, then just let them buy PS4s. Why would we make a PS5 and release a PS5 and just stymie and basically abort this yeah. console that's going to sell 100 million units, keeping in mind that it's already surpassed PS3 sales in three and a half, four fewer years? Yeah, no, they've, they've got a good momentum going, and I think they're probably going to keep that momentum going into 2019, especially with all the exclusives they have lined up for that year. I think even revealing it in 2019 would, would be a mistake. I think, again, I think February 2020 is probably the likely place, just because, again... There's no reason to interrupt it. And also, 2020 is just a, a sexy year. This is a nice, futuristic-sounding year. It's like a perfect time to release something. It is. and Marketing-wise, I think that that's just like pretty perfect timing. Reminds me of Dreamcast with 9999. I mean, that was, yeah. for people that were around and remember that, that was a huge marketing campaign, and that was a very memorable thing. I'll never forget that, and I bought it that day. But I don't know. There's a lot of different ways that they can go. I don't think going early necessarily matters. Xbox 360 went in 2005. PS3 went in 2006. Xbox 360 ended up getting outsold when all things came and settled down. But it did have an advantage for the first half because of that. Because mm -hmm. people didn't want to wait. And Xbox 360, for people that... I remember when my roommate in college, Doug, got his Xbox 360 at launch in the fall of 2005. It was so impressive. I was like, I had never seen anything like this oh, console. Yeah. That console flipped me out. 
The fact that there was a, the the controller was wireless by default and confused the hell out of me. Yeah, it was wireless. I, was like, I don't understand this. And it had an interface, which was amazing. I think you know, I was talking to Aaron about this, my girlfriend, because she's so used to using PS4, and mm-hmm. I was telling her, you know, PS3's interface, as we discussed, I think was so bad. But we had a time not too long ago, and I think most people remember this, where you your console didn't do anything if there wasn't a game in it. Like you, you didn't turn on your console and then it just did a bunch of shit for you. And Xbox 360 was the first console I ever saw where I'm like, wow, you can actually like dick around with this thing yeah, as yeah. if it's like an interface or a little computer. I still think that if anyone goes first, Microsoft goes first. And I think that it benefits Microsoft to go first. I think that 100%. there's no benefit, I think, in Sony going first. And Microsoft will maybe send their console out first. But the thing that confuses me about this is that in all their new acquisitions for studios at Microsoft and Microsoft's camp, they can't possibly be ready to go, and they probably won't be ready to go even in 2020. Some of them might have had projects that, that were acquired midway through or whatever from another publisher. But I think Microsoft actually has to let these things settle for a little while. So I wouldn't be surprised if they both went at the same time hmm. and that that time might be 2020. They only released Xbox One and PS4 a week apart or two weeks apart the first time around. So it's not like that would be unprecedented. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be about who has the games and who has the launch library first. And that's what I'm excited about, Chris, although we have no information about that, is that yeah. I really feel that a game like Horizon 2 or something like that could be a launch game for PS5, which would be fucking gigantic, considering how big that is. Usually they go with a kill zone or something like that, which is fine. But yeah, but but again, like think about how many years in a row we saw Spider-Man before it came out. And think of like, do you think that PSX or at E3 that year that they would show Horizon to launch with the console? Maybe. Why wouldn't they? I don't know. I don't know because like I feel like they have the strategy of building stuff up for mm. a very long time and yeah. they have for a while. It's not like Bethesda who is like, hey, Fallout 4, it's out in like three months. Like Days Gone. How long have we known about Days Gone? It's Days Gone. I totally out. forgot that that the was The Last of out. Us. We've seen trailers for two years. You but, know what I mean? But doesn't that indicate that that's why they're going quiet now is because maybe they're changing? It I, does. But I... I, I don't know. I'm just going on like what we've seen, and it's just confusing right now because it, it seems like there's two philosophies going on that are constantly clashing with each other right now. They're like, all right, let's just stop. Let's just stop doing everything and just have like some release or some uh, not release, some uh, crazy event sometime in the future. Let's just put a hold on all this. What's interesting about it to me is that with console launches, they have to actually take into account not only enthusiast press and the enthusiasts like us, but actually mainstream press too. And that's mm-hmm. another thing that's really important. Like what, what is the Wall Street Journal and USA Today and the Washington Post going to write about PS5? And that's relevant. That's incredibly relevant to the market and incredibly relevant to kind of, you know, moms and dads and general consumers and people that aren't tuned in and that might buy one game or two games a year. They have a lot to balance. I would love to be a fly on the wall of their marketing oh, yeah. uh, and in their planning meetings because the one thing that's certain to me, the one thing that seems to be very certain to me is that Sony Interactive is becoming very American. Japan is ceding control, I think, very slowly in ver- different avenues. We can see that even with the censorship brouhaha going on right now, that this is really in America's camp because PS4 proved the Western dominance of this console by releasing here first. So I think whatever they do, it's coming out of San Mateo outside of San Francisco as opposed to Tokyo <laughs> HQ. I think that the power is shifting And with the power shifting, I think the expectations of how things are shifting, think about the way Japanese publishers talk about their games. We're going to talk about Final Fantasy in a little while Mm -hmm. and how ahead of the curve they are, uh, way too ahead of the curve and how they say things like, please, you know, they they ask like, please understand and please be patient and stuff. And you don't see that too much in Western development in comparison. So I just wonder if the entire thing is shifting, polarly shifting to an American or Western style, which is more immediate, more in your face more when it's ready. The unfortunate thing is that I just think that 2019 is going to be pretty quiet. Not for game releases. We're going to get Days Gone, Dreams, Ghost of Tsushima, The Last of Us, and maybe Death Stranding. Yeah. It's five games. And E3 is still happening. It's just not PlayStation oriented. Right. So we're still going to get Xbox kind of owns E3 at this point. Because Nintendo barely even showed. They do like a a direct around E3. Yeah. But now they're going to be the only ones. It's very interesting. It's going to be weird. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's all... This is a massive pressure. It's like a championship team. I think team. it's the opposite. You think so? I, yeah, I, because I think a, a big problem for Microsoft is they always had to go first at E3, and then when E3 was over, Sony would close the show, and everybody was like, ah, fuck, that was so amazing. We saw Kingdom Hearts for the sixth year in a row. Oh, my gosh. Right. You know, and now they don't have to deal with that. Now they own the show. It's going to be interesting. It could be viewed as, like, a really bad, like, amount of pressure, but I think it, I think it also could be, like, oh, awesome. You know what I mean? I think it depends. It does depend. It, it totally all depends, depends on how they. It can go one way or the other. <laughs> it all depends on how they, you know, handle it. But because they've already made so many big announcements now, 
Microsoft, what would be really fascinating, I would love this, I would love this, is if Microsoft was like, we are, all, they already said that they're going to be there, but I would love if they were just like, we're not going either. <laughs> and I'd be like, what is, What's happening? what is happening here? This is awesome. But that's, they already made their little tweet saying they'd be there. Yeah. I personally think the pressure's on. You know, it, it reminds me a lot of sports analogies where like a team that's, you know, well, we just saw this with the Rams, for instance, they finally lose a game. They're like nine and one and they're like, the pressure's off. Now we've lost. Now that's we don't a, have to worry about being perfect anymore. You know, and it's a win lose scenario. This can go very well for yeah, them. They're yeah. gonna ha- all the spotlight's gonna be on them, and it can go very bad. I think it's I think it's the pressure's off. I think it's interesting. We will see. We'll see. Eric Adams wrote in and said, "Gentlemen, it seems to be of no real surprise that PlayStation is skipping out on E3 in 2019. The relevance of the show has been waning for many years, and I think it speaks to the overall state of gaming right now that the top dog of this console generation doesn't feel the need to be there. My question is this: With 24/7 access to breaking gaming news and product reveals, is there still a future for convention-style location-based events? PAX is evolving to include slash promote additional multimedia entities, podcasters, YouTubers, etc. But will that be enough to maintain four shows a year? Was Nintendo actually ahead of the curve with its directs?" Would love to hear your thoughts. There is no doubt that Nintendo is ahead of the curve with its directs, although I find them more overwhelming than usual in the more that they go on. But yeah, I like watching Nintendo's little edited things where they tell you exactly what they want to tell you. And I said this about Square Enix, too, when they did their little presentation during E3 instead of doing a conference that respected my time. And I, I appreciate that. So I think that, you know, I'm even surprised. And I've heard in, I've heard it from many of my own developer friends and publishing friends and contacts. Everyone is tired of all of these shows. Everyone. I don't think that there's one person that's like, great, there's four PAXs. Awesome. (laughs) I don't think anyone feels that way unless you're going as an enthusiast. But the people that are making the games and showing the games, you know, and then there's PSX and there's EGX overseas and there's stuff in Toronto with Fan Expo or whatever. And there's E3 and there's Gamescom and there's Tokyo Game Show and Paris Games. It's like every fucking two seconds. And I think these guys are finally pushing back being like, nah, we can't operate our companies like this. This That's what I mean, though. That's why I like, because like, E3 to me is like the one that's justifiable because you actually get stuff out of it. It's not like Gamescom where it's like for several years, nothing happens and then maybe one thing gets launched or revealed. There's too many little things that just kind of are shittier E3s to me. And I'm not saying like as a convention, I'm saying as like a, sh- as like a live kind of show. You know what I mean? Because you can live stream packs. You're not going to really see anything of any substance right it's packs yeah i've done packs a few times like you and i will maybe probably do the show live at packs one year yeah that's what it's all about like the the show floor is fine i guess but i'm like the anti-enthusiast in this way like where I'm, i've never <laughs> been i've never been one to be like this is fun like i want to be at the show i want to wait in line for three hours to play a game i just oh yeah i'm not gonna wait i don't in get line off to play on a game that's ridiculous i don't get off on that i'll at play all. when i play it so i don't know i like celebrating nerd culture and enthusiasm in my own way but it's never been at these shows i've always kind of tried to avoid them Luke Ashmore wrote in and said, Hey, Colin and Chris, given Sony's upcoming absence at E3, I'm interested in what Microsoft and Nintendo could possibly do in order to make the most of the situation. This is an interesting question. He goes on, but I just want to really focus. We haven't talked about Nintendo, really. Mm-hmm. Nintendo is obviously always the odd man out, but they have a very strong platform in Switch, and they have a lot of momentum going right now. Pokemon game just came out. They're going to have more to show. I actually think one of the big and interesting openings here in terms of oxygen in this vacuum is Nintendo at E3. Mm-hmm. Not that they're competing on the same plane, but whenever Sony's not there, like you said, to suck up the oxygen at the end of the show, this gives a lot more front heaviness to Microsoft and Nintendo's traditional pre-opening conferences. So while we focus on Xbox, I think Nintendo has a nice opening to do some cool stuff here, especially with third parties. And I'll be interested to see how that goes, although I have no insight into yeah, that. Maybe. I mean, I know there's rumors of like a, an upgraded model of a Switch or something that's been going around. Yeah, and the dockless Switch, which I think is a guarantee at this yeah. point. But I don't know. I, I'd be interested to see how Nintendo reacts to all this. I mean, they are a player. They are a relevant player. Absolutely. And finally, Al Karan wrote into us and said, What's up, Colin and Chris? With PlayStation not showing up at all at E3 in 2019, what do you think this does to the release dates for The Last of Us Part Two, Death Stranding, and Ghost of... You said Tsunami, but it's Tsushima. Do you think they will be cross-generation with PlayStation 5 at launch? And do you think it's a good idea to do that with so many PlayStation 4s out there already? Or do you think that it will cannibalize their games by being on both? Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Well, I think it's a given that PS5 will play PS4 games, so that's not going to be relevant. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it does anything. I think that we're going to get the release date announcements. I think we're probably going to get some release date announcements at the Game Awards, yeah, which is in December. But I've said before, I think you're going to get something like dreams you're probably gonna get dreams days gone the last of us part two and ghost of tsushima all in 2019 in that order yeah no i agree and then i think death stranding is gonna be a 2020 game we'll see i feel like because the architecture of these machines and and the way these games are made are a lot more pc oriented now 
they function very very much like PCs like especially with the you know the PS4 and the PS4 Pro playing the same games but like at different refresh rates or like maybe this oh this has more uh, this can render it at checkerboarded 4K you know I think what we're going to see is if any game that you're going to get on PS4 going forward on PS5 you're probably just going to be able to play that disc on PS5 and it'll just look better and perform better just like you would uh, be able to launch a game on a PC with an upgraded graphics card or an upgraded uh, RAM chip or, you know, I think that's probably what we're going to see. I'd be curious if they actually end up being different SKUs because that seems kind of old school now. Yeah, I don't think that you're going to see that. I think at the very best, like you said, maybe there'll be a rule where there has to be a patch that up reses things. If you le- release a game on PS4 as of this date, then it needs to interact with yeah. PS5 in a special way. Very similar to Pro. Yeah, they already do it. Right. So, and a lot of it happens automatically on Pro, but there are modes that you can select and it knows that you're playing on a Pro. So, I would assume that that's going to be a thing where, like, as of this date, if you release a game on PS4, it just needs to play nice with PS5 in not just a backwards compatible way, but in terms of an up res, like you said, resolution kind of way. All right, that's it for E3. We'll hear more about that, I doubt, but maybe we will. Maybe there'll <laughs> be more information about that in the near future. But very exciting and interesting news. Lots of speculation going on about PlayStation 5. Can't wait for us to hear and learn more about it. And I wish someone would talk to me on the record about it, but they won't. This is just fascinating, honestly. Number two, PlayStation 4 is officially five years old. Its fifth birthday was technically on November 15th, which marks five full calendar years since PS4 launched in America, the first territory it was available in on November 15th, 2013. To celebrate, Sony revealed some new interesting statistics about the console and how it's been doing those past five years. For starters, the console, as of mid-September, has surpassed 86 million units sold worldwide and will likely surpass 90 million sold by the end of the year. It's crazy. As of mid-June, so nearly six months ago, nearly 778 million pieces of software were sold for the console. The five best-selling games on the console over the past five years listed alphabetically are Call of Duty Black Ops 3, Call of Duty World War 2, FIFA 17, FIFA 18, and Grand Theft Auto 5. While the five most popular games on PS4 listed alphabetically are Call of Duty Black Ops 3, FIFA 17, FIFA 18, Fortnite, and Grand Theft Auto 5. The most downloaded PlayStation Plus free games over the last five years were Call of Duty Black Ops 3, Destiny 2, Dead by Daylight, Just Cause 3, and Mafia 3. And finally, the most popular controller colors in order are black, blue, red, white, and camo. Pretty interesting stats. What color is your controller or are your controllers? I have the red uh, Spider-Man PS4 one. Oh, nice. Yeah. I have like three or four black ones and then I have the orange one that is the sunset one or whatever that they just released in the States, but I bought it on Amazon like six or eight months ago and it was from the Middle East. (laughs) Like it was an official Sony product, but with Arabic writing on it from the Middle East territory. And then I remember they tweeted out, you know, we're releasing all these new colors and I'm like, I have had this color. You guys are just never released it here. So thank you for that. I bought it because it's Islanders colors, of course. Of course. Number three, Square Enix is officially working on a PlayStation 5 game. At least that's according to a LinkedIn profile for an artist at Square Enix-owned studio Luminous Productions named Tomohiro Tokoro, who in his CV notes that he's working on a, quote, new AAA title for PS5, end quote. As you may recall, Luminous Productions is a somewhat new entity, and its leader, Hajime Tabata, director of Final Fantasy XV, recently left Square Enix and its associated team for apparently greener pastures. This is one of the first references to PlayStation 5 by name, though Sony has recently spoken about its new hardware, setting expectations that it'll probably come later than we may have expected. While it's unlikely that final PS5 dev kits are in the wild, which is being reported in some locations, it's essentially guaranteed that studios are currently specking their games towards what Sony is likely telling them the PS5 can do. I personally know people working on PS5 games, so I can confirm that much. Andrew wrote into us and said, I doubt this is a question that could be answered, but it does interest me when it comes to behind the scenes working of Sony. The question is, when did you first start hearing about the PS5 or game devs working on PS5 games, Colin? How many months or years has it been since you heard the first confirmable story about either? It's probably been a year Mm -hmm. or a little bit more since I talked to someone that was conclusively working on a next gen console game. It's probably like late summer, early fall or fallish of 2017 when I first heard. So yeah, and these things, I mean, I'm sure it was going on longer than that. But again, you are specking your games on PC right now. I think I don't think dev I've heard, I've seen rumors that dev kits are out. I think it's way too soon for dev kits to be out. I think it's way too early for that. I, I doubt Sony has finalized anything about the console. But I could be wrong about that, especially if it's not coming out for two years. Then I really highly doubt that they finalized and made their orders and stuff Wait, like is that. This, they're saying that there's dev kits out? There is... have been rumors that dev kits are out, but I think that that's not true. That's insane. I, that I, sounds I crazy. I just don't think that's true. And, you know, I always think about how, like, uh, you can find pictures of it. Like, Wii games were being made on GameCube with special Wii controllers, like Wii modes attached to them because the Wii hardware was so late. It's always late. I don't think that the final dev kits, like a dev kit is going to go out until the year the console comes out. So you're probably not going to have that. But they put their games on PC, and the architecture, 
allows them to quickly kind of transfer these games around. And they're probably telling them this is what we think it's going to do. And this is how it's going to run. And then we go from there. So I think that's how the games are being built right now. Number four, speaking of Square Enix, it's also time to talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake, the game that will never come out. <laughs> According to a report on Silicon Era, Tetsuya Nomura, the remake's director, told famous Japanese gaming publication Famitsu that, quote, There's been some misinformation regarding Final Fantasy VII Remake in some parts of the internet, so I wanted to touch up on that a little, end quote. Noting that some people are reporting that the game's development hasn't even started or is still early, he says, quote, Yes, that is not official. As I said during E3, development is going favorably. I just wanted to say that the current PR priority is Kingdom Hearts 3, as it was during Artnia, the Artnia event the other day. But after that, it'll be Final Fantasy VII Remake, so please don't worry, end quote. Final Fantasy VII Remake is a fully remade iteration of Squaresoft's famous 1997 JRPG Final Fantasy VII. The remake was first announced at E3 2015 and was originally under development externally by CyberConnect2, the Japanese studio best known for its Dot .hack and Naruto games. That apparently didn't go well, and Square Enix brought the game in-house several years after it was announced. It's slated to be released episodically, though it's unclear when or how the game will begin to roll out. With Kingdom Hearts 3 due out in late January of 2019, however, it could be that Square Enix will truly begin focusing on Final Fantasy VII Remake following the game's launch. I still don't believe that we're going to see the entire yeah. thing. I don't believe it. Yeah. Episodically is, is also like a bad, I, like why? Why would you do that? Because I think it will never come out otherwise. I think they'll literally never have anything. The famous story about Nomura is that he didn't even know that he was directing the game until he saw it on an internal presentation in a meeting. I mean, this is the kind of shit we're talking about with this game. I don't understand how anyone can look at the development of Final Fantasy 15, what just happened with Final Fantasy 15's DLC, Tabata leaving, Kingdom Hearts 3 being in development for fucking ever, and then you somehow think that Final Fantasy 7 Remake, which was in development at CyberConnect 2 for three years, and then they took it back from them. <laughs> Give me a break. It's a mess. Like, I, I just don't think... And then they were like, this is the weirdest thing for me, and I remember talking about this like ad nauseum at the time. They were saying that Final Fantasy 7 Remake would be the biggest game. It's too big. Final Fantasy 7 is too big to remake as one game. That's what they were saying. What does that this mean? was before Final Fantasy 15 came out. So I was like, what you're telling me is Final Fantasy 7 is bigger than your most recent Final Fantasy game and you cannot make it as one game because it is too big. It is bigger than every Final Fantasy game that has come out in the last 21 years. It doesn't make any sense. There's something deeply strange about this product and everything Square Enix does, frankly. Yeah. I, <laughs> man, 2015 is when they revealed it? Yes. Wow. At E3. Wow. And, I mean, it was in development before that. They, I know they said yeah, in 2015 yeah. it entered full development. I don't know what they were thinking giving it to CyberConnect. No disrespect to those guys, but that is not a AAA studio. I know people like the Naruto games. I know people like .hack. That's fine. CyberConnect is not capable of making this game. And so I don't even know what they were thinking. It was not even important enough for them to make it internally. Well, hey, man, that fake reveal or whatever the hell they showed was looked pretty cool. <laughs> it looks cool as hell, and the gameplay looks cool. I mean, they showed segments of Midgar and stuff like that. Yeah. They just don't understand what people want. That's the problem. No one wants them to remake Final Fantasy VII like, and like redesign it. And that's what they're doing. They're making it an action RPG. Just remake the fucking game. Pound for pound. They already note have. For note. They already have several times. But it's when, out. When, in what way? Like, and they just re-released? Well, they re yeah. But what I'm saying is like, just like they did with Spyro. Spyro is beat for beat the same game. It's totally remade, yeah, but yeah, it's 100%. beat for beat the same game. Same with Crash. They could have done that with Final Fantasy VII. No one's asking them for anything like this. When they were talking about Final Fantasy VII Remakes, which, by the way, goes all the way back to the PS2 era, if you want to go read about it, there's a fascinating interview on RPG Gamer from 2000 or 2001 where they were talking about how they wanted to remake Final Fantasy VII for the PS2. This is how long this has been going on. There's no compelling reason why they should have thought, we're going to remake this classic game and we're just going to totally, it's going to be a completely different game now. New dialogue. All I'm like, no one asked for this. This is not what we meant. Yeah. I will really be interested because even if the first episode comes out, it's like, I think the first episode is only through Midgar. What if it's incredible graphics, but it's still the same, <laughs> the same models with like the big, like yeah. chunky arms, rectangle arms and stuff like yeah. that? Yeah. would be awesome. That'd be amazing. We'll see. Number five. Unfortunately, we have to talk about THQ Nordic yet again because they continue to move and shake. For starters, the Austrian publisher has acquired a new studio to bring in its first party, Bugbear Entertainment, which hails from Finland. Bugbear was, I just said Finland. Bugbear was founded in 2000, and you'll likely know it best for its flat-out racing series, which began on PS2 in 2004. Its newest game, Wreckfest, will be released by THQ Nordic for PS4 in 2019. 
The publisher also revealed that it acquired Coffee Stain Studios, a Swedish team founded in 2010. Coffee Stain Studios is behind the two Sanctum FPS games, though it became most famous for 2014's Goat Simulator. It has since turned into a bit of an indie publisher, so it's unclear what THQ Nordic plans to do with the team. Meanwhile, THQ Nordic also revealed its Q3 2018 quarterly financial results. Net sales for the publisher are up 1,403% year over year, largely fuck? driven by its acquisition of substantial publisher Deep Silver. Most staggeringly, though, THQ Nordic revealed that it has 35 games in development that haven't been announced. 20 more games are in development but have been announced, including titles like Metro Exodus, which is due out in 2019. So there are at least 55 games or 60 games. 55, I guess it would be. This is... In, this is... <laughs> <laughs> Dorian Brown wrote into us and said, as THQ Nordic continues to buy up companies in a quest for world domination, I ask a simple question. Has this ever happened quite to this scale in the gaming industry before? What is the final goal? Are they planning the most B-list Smash Brothers type game ever? Love your guys' content. Keep up the great work. It's hard to say. I don't yeah. really understand. I really feel like this is impossible. Oh, of course. 55 games. 55 games in development. 55. How is that possible? When the big behemoth <laughs> studios... And the big behemoth publishers, like Activision might have six games in development right now. Yeah. Across all of its teams, right? Activision. Sony, maybe 10, including the PS5, maybe 12, including small and VR games. And then obviously its second party would grow bigger than that. 55? How do you even have a production pipeline from your publisher? And what I mean by that is producers come often internally, but also from the publisher side. So how do you even have a publisher structure that's monitoring all of this? I feel like they, they probably tried to buy this show at some point. They're constantly buying shit. It doesn't make sense. But apparently, I don't know, what is it, a thousand percent? Yeah. And I again, mean, I think that it has a lot to do with Deep Silver. Yeah, yeah, of course. And all of that, but... Metro Exodus is a THQ Nordic game? Yeah. Because it was a Deep Silver game. What the... F wow. Because the other okay. Metro games were Deep Silver games. Right. I didn't even think about that. So... Deep Silver is like a completely different dev. THQ Nordic is <laughs> scaling up for a complete disaster. I, I don't know how this is possible. I don't know what the investment looks like. I don't know where the capital's coming from. These aren't big games. I mean, Metro Exodus is a pretty big game, and they have some other... But they have nothing, not one game on the level of a big AAA game from Activision or Ubisoft. Or, they have no Assassin's Creed. They have no Spider-Man. So there, there's no tentpole for them to even make money and then spread it around. I don't get it. It's I don't incredibly get it. confusing. I can't see the logic behind any of this. And it just it, it feels like a, like a fever dream. It feels fake. This feels like an Onion story. 55 games, 55 Jeez. games in development, 35 of them unannounced, 35 unannounced games. How, <laughs> how do you have, how are there even 35 you know game that ideas? Is, that, you know what that means? That means uh, somebody pitched something and they wrote it down in an in a Excel spreadsheet. They're like, ah, oh, that's a good dude. Jim's game. <laughs> I got a bad feeling about these guys. I really Jim's do. game coming out Q1 2022. <laughs> Jim's game. Number six. Telltale Games, or what's left of it, has officially entered liquidation to pay back its creditors and its outstanding debts, according to a report on Game Daily. The website notes that Telltale is in what's called assignment and not bankruptcy, meaning that it can and is actively seeking out avenues to pay its debts by actively leveraging what it owns and operates. As of the time I'm writing this, it appears that the situation has resulted in certain games being taken down from Steam, though PS4 seems to still have all of Telltale Games' titles up, according to reports. It could be that the stakeholders may intend to re-release those games in their, on their own to make their money back, though that's conjecture. What is confirmed by Game Daily, though, is that because of the liquidation process, all laid-off Telltale employees who already didn't receive standard severance of any kind will lose their Cobra health benefits, too, at the end of November. So, that's the end of that, I guess. Yeah. Very sad. Again, remember Skybound, who is, I think, Robert Kirkham, that's his name, right? The guy who made Walking Dead, that's his company, yeah. and they're going to kind of finish the series... For Telltale, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know who they hired, but it looks like Telltale is finished completely now. And we obviously wish our very best to those who are losing their benefits, especially right around the holidays, which is always pleasant. Yeah, that's awful. Number seven, Final Fantasy XIV is getting a major new expansion called Shadowbringers. Shadowbringers is set to be launched in the summer of 2019, according to Square Enix, and will be immediately available for the PS4 iteration of Final Fantasy XIV upon launch. The news was first reported at a fan festival, a Final Fantasy XIV-centric event in Las Vegas, and the announcement came from the mouth of, of Naoki Yoshida himself. Yoshida, of course, is the game's director and producer. Little else is known about Shadowbringers at present, though we'll open up lots of new quests and even a new job and race, along with a raised level cap and much more. And people really enjoy that game. I don't play it because I'm not a gigantic nerd, but I know some of you out there <laughs> really wanted to hear that news. And finally, Chris, a wrap-up. Oh, good. Number eight, PSVR-centric shooter In Death is coming to PSVR on November 27th. November 27th will also see the release of Floor Kids on PS4, a game all about breakdancing. 
Subnautica, the beloved underwater exploration experience, is coming to PlayStation 4 very soon on December 7th, according to website Push Square. Push Square also reports that Nippon Marathon, a truly bizarre racing game, is PS4 bound on December 17th. Sony has confirmed that PUBG is indeed coming to PlayStation 4 on December 7th, indicating recent rumors were indeed true. Website Gamatsu reports that gruelingly difficult side-scrolling 2D RPG Kingdom 2 Crowns and pixelated racer Desert Child are both coming to PlayStation 4 on December 11th. First-person or I'm sorry, first-person action RPG Warhammer Vermintide 2 is coming to PlayStation 4 on December 18th. Long in development PS4 and Vita RPG 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, which is being created by celebrated studio Vanillaware, has been delayed and the Vita version has been canceled, also according to Gamatsu, who also notes that visual novel World End Syndrome is coming to Western PS4s in the spring of 2019. 2D side-scrolling old-school shooter Blazing Chrome is coming to PlayStation 4 sometime in 2019. And finally, strange horror game Five Nights in Freddy's, or Five Nights at Freddy's, right? Five Nights at Freddy's is coming to PS4 in the future, aiming for a 2019 release year. Man, that's like, what, seven years after that game was... I don't know anything about that game. That was big in, like, 2013, 2012. No. (laughs) No, it 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 was around the time when, like, Slender was a thing, you know, when people were just making these, like kind of like quick horror games that caught the internet by storm because a lot of people would make videos of them playing it and screaming. It's one of those. Right, right. Yeah. Like Outlast. Not even because Outlast has like animations (laughs) (laughs) and production value. Fair enough. Chris, let's get into the newer game releases. All right. Before we do, Brett Herman wrote into us and said, hey, Colin and Chris, are there any good simulators that you guys like? I saw Farming Simulator 17 in the store, and if there are 16 other Farming Simulator games, it might be worth trying. I personally enjoy City Skylines. What about you guys? Do you like the simulation genre at all? Oh, yeah. Red Dead 2 is great. Oh, yeah. You like the sim aspects yeah, of, the, of taking care of yourself? A, cow- a cowboy sim. No, I don't know. I, I used to like The Sims when I was a kid. I'm not really into it all that much anymore. I, I got enough shit in real life to simulate, you know? Adult simulator? Yeah, it's like it's like, when people, it's like when people would be like, hey, let's play Monopoly. It's like it's just like literally just taxes. The game. It's just adulthood. I already do this. I am dominant at Monopoly. Dom- yeah? I'm a I, do- I, I am a that dominant Monopoly me. player. That doesn't surprise me. You gotta you. put people away in Monopoly, dude. I hate Monopoly so much. I play so aggressively that I think it takes people by surprise how aggressively <laughs> I, I like Do you the, play it like people play Risk? In what way? Because I love Risk. Just very aggressively. Oh, well, I, I used to play in Risk tournaments in San Francisco. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Risk is awesome. I, I love like, Risk and yeah. Axis and Allies and all those. But in Monopoly, the entire idea, obviously you want to get one Monopoly, at least one Monopoly. But then what people don't realize is just immediately start mortgaging everything that isn't a Monopoly. Just gather a bunch of money and just put hotels on whatever you can and then just sit there. Chris, why don't you begin by reading the first game? Sure thing. What is, what is this? Atch-tongue, Cth- Atch Tongue Cth... Ach tongue Cthulhu tactics. I think ach tongue is Ach-tung? warning or attention in German. I think. Okay. Ach tongue. Ach tongue. Cthulhu tactics comes to PS4. Explore the Lovecraft meets World War II universe of ach tongue Cthulhu tactics, a turn-based tactical strategy game set in in the award-winning ach tongue Cthulhu universe. I know nothing. I, want, I know nothing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about I know that. I wanted you to this. say Cthulhu again because I still don't really understand how that's said. It's Cthulhu or Cthulhu. Is like the two pronunciations. As Why does there's too many consonants? Is what's the problem? Oh yeah, C T U. What is that? It makes it sound alien. It does. Battlefield Five comes to PS4 at retail. Enter mankind's greatest conflict with Battlefield Five as the series goes back to its roots in a never before seen portrayal of World War II. I highly doubt it was never before seen. Take on all out multiplayer across the world or witness human drama set against global combat in single player war stories. I love Battlefield One. I, I asked E3, I, or um, E3, I asked EA for copies of the game. I was having a nice correspondence with them. They never sent the games, but damn, they did add me to all their fucking mailing lists, so thanks for that. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm happy about this one. Beat Saber comes to PSVR. Enjoy uh, precisely handcrafted levels and exclusively created electronic dance music, all embedded in an appealing futuristic world. Swing your sabers, match the color in the right direction to slash the cubes, and keep up the adrenaline-pumping music. This game is going to make you dance. It's a bad description, but it's great. Yeah, you're excited about it. I'm going to pick it up. It's great. It's the only VR game that I could actually recommend. Bendy and the Ink Machine comes to PS4. Bendy and the Ink Machine is a first-person puzzle action horror game. Wow, that's a lot. That begins in the far days past of animation and ends in a very dark future. With twists and turns around every corner, this game is sure to thrill you and decimate your childhood. That's interesting. Holy so it's a game about moly. it's it's about animation? I guess. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, it sounds neat. I don't want it to decimate my childhood. That I mean, sounds a that's already up. gone. It's already it's a lost cause. That's true. That's true. Boxing Apocalypse comes to PSVR. Trapped in an alien prison, you must fight your way to freedom in this action combat game featuring a fully immersive intuitive fight system. All right. There's a lot of boxing games now coming to PSVR. Yeah. 
It's the, probably the easiest thing to simulate in VR. To yeah, be it's true. Crow the Legend comes to PS4 in this animated movie. Crow is the most admir. What? Wait, what? In this Wait, animated what? movie, Crow is the most admired animal in the forest with his magnificent colors and beautiful voice. But when the first winter arrives, can Crow make the personal sacrifices needed to save his friend? Wait, wait, what? What? <laughs> it says in this animated movie. I got. Uh, is this like those uh, Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys kind of games? I don't know. It reminds me of that game. What was that one game? Fuck. Linger in Shadows on PS3. I never made heard by of a studio in Poland called plastic <laughs> they made these games called demo scene games that were more like demonstrations of what things can do and they made a game on ps3 that was really weird called weird called the torah that some people might remember d-a-t-u-r-a it was a ps3 exclusive that used move weird and there reminds me that maybe it's that like it's an experience it's expert yeah i don't know i, I don't know whatever who cares <laughs> <Let's move forward. laughs> farming simulator 19 comes to ps4 at retail the ultimate farming simulation returns with a complete graphics overhaul and the most complete farming experience ever. Become a modern farmer and develop your farm filled with exciting new farming activities, crops, and animals. So I'm going to be honest with you about this. Mm -hmm. I get intrigued by this game every year. Yeah. Like, no, I kind of I mean, yeah. want to play it. I kind of want to do it. What's, nothing, yeah, no but, one it, can but it's always kind of. Yeah. It's always, it never really crosses the threshold into actually wanting to do it. There's got to be something about it, right? They annualized it. I mean, it's probably cheap to make and yeah. sells enough to justify it. Sure. Maybe this will be the year. Flashback comes to PS4 at retail 2142. After fleeing from a spaceship but stripped of all memory, the eminent scientist Conrad B. Hart awakens on Titan, a colonized moon of the planet Saturn. He must find a way back to Earth, defending himself against the dangers he encounters and unraveling an insidious extraterrestrial plot that threatens the planet. What is this? Gundamonians? Gundamoniums. G Gundamoniums. What the hell? What? Instead of pandemonium or oh, something? Oh, Gundamonium. Okay, yeah. I, I would assume. But it's plural, which is weird. Yes. It's Gundamoniums. <laughs> right. <laughs> Gundamoniums comes to PS4. Gundamoniums is a revamped version of the cult classic PC classic... Wait, the cult Japanese PC classic Gundamonium first released in 2003. This side-scrolling high-speed Dan... Dan Maku... Dan Maku... Japanese... Stop! Dan Maku shoot him up. No, you're having a you're having a fucking Every, nervous breakdown. Yeah, I swear to God, Japanese stuff just like turns me into a, like an infant. Uh, Dan Maku shoot him up has a focus on navigating the mazes created by a certain fire. I don't know what Dan Maku means. Barrage in <sighs> Japanese. You wouldn't know that. Nerd. It's a it's a dweeb. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just another way to say it's a shmup. Right. <laughs> Mecha Wars Desert Ashes comes to PS4 and Vita. A classic reborn, casual turn-based strategy in a land of fantastical creatures and deadly machines. In the aftermath of a great flood, a vengeful leader threatens to conquer the world with the aid of a once-lost technology, and only a small but determined army stands in their path. I played Desert Ashes on Vita a few years ago. I don't know what this... It was just called Desert Ashes. I don't know what this is, but I think it's a similar game. It might be the same game. You're going to have to look into that. I don't know, maybe. Slayaway Camp, Butcher's Cut, comes to Vita. We read this before in another episode. I remember this We read this last week. I think it might have come to PS4, maybe? Mi no, it's, well, it says Vita here. I know, but maybe last week it came to PS4. Oh, or maybe. Or someone's true. having an aneurysm on the PlayStation blog and keeps putting the same fucking game. That's in entirely it. possible. Slayaway Camp, Butcher's Cut, comes to Vita, a killer puzzle game where you control Skullface, an adorably demented murderer across hundreds of isometric levels, puzzle levels, and a darkly comic homage to 80s horror movies. Yeah, you definitely read that last week. Yeah. Squishies comes to PSVR. Yay. Get lost in a cheerful world of full of adventures. <laughs> Squishies is a single <laughs> is your kind of game. Squishies dude. is a single player puzzle platform experience built exclusively for PlayStation VR. Solve puzzles and save squishies or be creative and build your own levels and then share them with the community. Squishies. Sounds vaguely sexual, actually. That's Come gross. Yeah, it is. And now uh Storm Boy <laughs> comes to PS4 based on Colin Fields. 1964 children's book of the same name, Storm Boy, takes place on the beaches of South Australia near the mouth of Murray River, where the titular protagonist rescues orphaned pelican chicks, <laughs> <laughs> one of whom later becomes the child's pet and faithful companion, Mr. Percival. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yes that sold me on we this, are digging deep is. now for inspiration for the video games the 1964 <laughs> children's book storm boy is now a video game orphaned pelican chicks is an amazing i thought you would like this since you're into the titanic talk lately uh, titanic yeah. vr comes to psvr 
Titanic VR is a diving simulator and immersive interactive story. You will leave with a greater understanding of the historic tragedy that unfolded in 1912, leading to the sinking of the world's most famous ship. <laughs> Holy moly. I saw a slide based on the Titanic. I know. I it's the go- funny. You got to go. Do you still have that? Is that pinned on your... I don't know if it, it's not pinned. I still have the picture though. It's it's one of the greatest things I've ever that seen. Video it's just was a slide up. of a Titanic where people are just supposed to slide down as if their lives are uh, soon to be over with. <laughs> anyway, the last game we got is uh, YouTuber's Life coming to PS4. Become the most successful YouTuber on the planet. Create videos, get subscribers, attend events. Yeah, sure. Interact with your fans. Yeah, all right. And grow your channel. Live a true YouTuber's life. I wonder if that encapsulates also unyielding stress. Yeah, live the unyielding stress and inability to get <laughs> to get your videos to your subscribers on YouTube or life. I was looking up the trophies for this. I'm gonna do. A, I think I'm gonna do a let's play for this. YouTube is like if you like put stat boosts on your uh, RPG character, and then sometimes they just they just didn't work. You know? Yeah. It's just like oh, you're I'm at zero. I'm at zero right now. Slick. Even though I have like four points in charisma and like ten points in strength and shit. It's nice. Side quest. My YouTube channel used to be like a weekly show, and I've just been putting way more effort now. My podcast will always be weekly into being like you know what. I'm going to do a couple of month, a few a month, maybe a let's play here and there. If this YouTube, would be a fun one. If, yeah. If YouTube's not going to like give me any control over who's getting my content, then why am I going to put any time and effort into this anymore? Yeah. Like compared to the way I used to. I still love doing the show. I want to do the show, but it's the lowest priority on the totem pole for me now because of their stupid shit. The trophies, by the way, are awesome. For YouTuber's life? Yeah. Oh my God. The trophy called Bye Bye Mom. You've moved to the student's flat. I'm living in the penthouse. You've moved to the luxury apartment. The last boundary. You've moved to the space mansion. Love is in the air. You've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend. What the fuck? Too many haters around. You've got your first hater. Oh, my God. Let me see here. Let That's see. atrocious. My big YouTuber wedding. You've married a YouTuber. Ah! Let me, let me look here. I think I can handle more. this. <laughs> I don't think I can handle this. Best Composer Award. You wrote your first five-star song. What? What is going Five-star song? So you could be a musician. You could be a chef, it looks like. Five-star? Are songs... Gra- graded on a star scale this computer rocks by the best widgets for your computer oh my god yeah we're done here i'm okay. leaving actually <laughs> the episode's over <laughs> there's a weird one though bread eater you've eaten 10 pieces of bread that's one of the trophies oh but, is that like when you're like starting out and you're dirt poor and all you can afford is bread and, and so. a, a box of I'm corn i'm playing pops? the shit out of this game this game oh, comes yeah. out tonight at midnight <laughs> as of recording and i'm it's beautiful I'm, I'm gonna fucking murder this game should we uh, get into the reader mail? Let's do it, Chris, shall we? I've selected six additional questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience. Remember, by supporting us on patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, you don't only get ad-free early access to every episode of Sacred Symbols, but you also get the ability to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas to us. Almost 100 of you did, did uh, that this week. I appreciate you guys. I'm trying to spread the love around. I'm sorry that yeah. I can't get to all of you, but that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Be sure to support us. You'll get like a, a, a neat little uh, salt shaker filled with every every person who donates ten thousand dollars or more gets a free salt shaker filled with our dead skin. Whoa! Yeah, that's not true. But I mean, if you want to give us ten thousand dollars, we can we can make that happen. <laughs> we can certainly make that happen, and I appreciate you very much. Oh, remember also that you want to be pithy with your questions, comments, concerns. I'm starting to scroll pithy. through questions. It's a good. It's it's, it's a good word. T- it's, it is a good word. It is, I got to be honest with you. I got that word from all of the years that I used to watch Bill O'Reilly when I was that's, a kid. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Bill O'Reilly has kind of fallen from grace. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, grace. I don't, so, know if there was, I don't know if there was that much grace there. No. I think he was like maybe at the gates of grace. Yeah. But I remember being a kid. I used to watch the O'Reilly Factor when I was like a kid in the late 90s, early 2000s. And he always would, he would read questions at the end. And he would say to be pithy. And that's where I got that word from. And I never lost it. So I'm asking you to be pithy because some people are writing literally 500 words. And what I do is I just scroll through that question because I don't have time to read it. Yeah. I'm sorry. You got to be... Come on. Yeah. We got a lot to get through. Colin Moriarty's got a lot of things to do in his life. Jorge Palomino wrote into us and said, hey guys, thanks for all the great work. Of course. With the rumor that Microsoft is coming out with a new version of the Xbox One with the ability to read, without the, I think you mean without the ability to read this. In a post-Game Pass world where, where, what happened here? Let me read this again. In a post-Game Pass world where I think this could be a good idea for cheaper, for a cheaper console, do you think we could see something similar from Sony? Thank you for rescuing me. Yeah, thanks I was having a fucking brain meltdown. (laughs) Thanks again for the incredible work you guys put in. Yeah. Is that a rumor? That is a rumor. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't have many connections in the Xbox world to know if that's true or not. But the rumor is that Microsoft is going to reveal and release a diskless or driveless version of Xbox One. Particularly if you're in an uh, in a location or uh, an area, be it like a, a city with decent internet connection, and you and you don't really need discs. I, I know personally, I haven't bought a disc in. I think the last disc I got was maybe Metal Gear Solid Five 
on Xbox One, and that was like what 2015 was that game? Yes. Yeah, September so first, two thousand fifteen. Yeah, so it's been it's been a while since I've bought a disc. I would totally be fine with a cheaper console that d- just does away with the disc drive. Uh, I know that it's not really an option for a lot of people, especially in the Midwest where there's like still a blockbuster. Yeah, or or the blockbuster. Yeah, since there's one left. I don't think you're going to see this from Sony. I think it's a good idea and an interesting idea. And God, we've been talking about discless consoles forever. I just don't know how much money that removes from the console itself i mean that's the only reason you would release it is if you can make it cheaper and raise your margins as a corporation by removing those components you probably could i think you could, but i don't know if it's worth it i don't know yeah maybe i don't know it is unnecessary cost i think it's like there's no real need for it unless what do you what do you plan dvds on it here's the thing about this is that and and this is just an interesting thing i guess it's not really sony or microsoft's problem but here's what will happen when they do this how many fucking people will go buy this thing and not know and not know yeah it's the um, same thing with Wii U. That happened with Wii U. They just have the to be naming. super clear about it. Right. I mean, it's not ultimately their problem, but yeah. it's just like, I can just imagine thousands of people going home with this thing and, be, and trying to shove discs into every fucking orifice of it, not knowing that it doesn't take discs. I think what would be interesting is if PlayStation 5 had multiple SKUs right out of the gate, one that read discs, one that didn't. And yeah. it was just a $100 difference and you can buy one or the other. I, I, feel, like that's, cool I feel like that's more likely to happen. I don't think they're going to be separated by a year i think that'd be kind of or like one would come out before the other one i think they would probably be two skews of the same thing that came out at the same time probably 2020 yeah i think they would just have to make sure to like <laughs> send out a copy to every <laughs> retailer to be like hey this is how you're supposed to just be sure to let people know that this doesn't have a disc drive in it because the wii u was like a joke i'm connected to this world and i still when the wii u came out i was like what what is what yeah i mean why would you, why would it not connect to the original wii yeah I don't know. It's, it's, what, yeah. I hated that fucking thing. I hated it. It was awful. I remember when we got it's the worst controller ever. Honestly, oh my god, it's horrible. The Wii U sucks. The analog I hate sticks the are above the face buttons. What is that? No, I know. When I was playing, that's true. When I played Mass Effect Three on it for a review because they just randomly released Mega or Mass Effect Three as a launch game yeah. without ever releasing the other Mass Effect games on Nintendo platforms, and I remember playing and be like, I can't. It's just, it's a total di- different muscle memory. Like, you can't relearn that. Yeah. I don't know how you're supposed to relearn that. That was like, so- <laughs> I <laughs> forgot about that. I'm actually having a meltdown. <laughs> He's having like a, an aneurysm. I forgot about that because I remember when I picked up the first time, you were just used to your fingers moving a certain way. It's what I was talking about the other day where I'm like, X is jump. X is jump, damn it. Well, yeah, well, I also like play with like kind of like a claw thing going on where like I have, uh, I'm typically like my f- thumbs are always on the sticks and my index finger kind of goes across the face buttons. Because oh, that's how it's like, yeah, because when you're playing like competitive shooters and stuff, it's just, it's better to just do that, to not sacrifice your ability to look around, <laughs> just to jump. But the second you play on the Wii U controller, you can't do that. And it just, it blew my, I never touched it again. I played like one thing of some Mario game and I was like, I, I can't. No, I hated that console. That console was just, I think that console is objectively terrible. Like, I, I don't <laughs> understand how, I had a conversation with my brother about this on our retro <laughs> podcast, Knockback, where I'm like, we were talking about what the worst Nintendo hardware was, and he was like, I like the Wii U. And he t- talked about the N64 being his least favorite. I'm like, that's a respectable answer, but I don't know how it can't be the Wii U. Yeah. I just don't understand. I remember playing, got a little bit of like that Ubisoft launch game Zombie, Zombie oh, U. Oh, yeah, Zombie U. That came out on other platforms and took the yeah, U out. Yeah, just called Zombie with no E at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I got to go. I got to move on. Joel Gutierrez wrote in and said, do you guys use headphones when playing games? If so, what are your preferred brands? Also, what kind of traditional audio systems do you use? Curiosity from an audiophile. Are you into game audio? Is this I used to, to do that when I was an elite gamer kid. Oh. When I was in uh, up in New York, when I was like probably like 17. When I, was, when I first found out that there were these headphones on the market that you could play games at. And, and it was more of like a, yeah, I could play at full volume and my parents won't hear. Right. Sick. But that was really it. And like the second I didn't need to do that, I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do this because it's uncomfortable for me to have something over my head unless I'm in a situation where, you know, I, it, like I bring headphones here all the time. Like people are always commenting on my headphones. They're like, why? You, those are huge headphones. It's because I don't like I walk everywhere and I don't like just meandering in silence. Right. So I like to play music. But when I'm playing a game, I don't want to have this thing crushing my head. Yeah, I you know respect I mean? that completely. Yeah, I'm not much of an audio guy when it comes to games typically. I'm an audio guy when it comes, we're both musicians and I'm an audio guy when it comes to music, but I've said before that unless it's a narrative driven game, and even if it is, that I often play with like podcasts or music playing on the side and just don't even hear the game. Like Spyro, I don't know what, I've not heard a lick of that game sound, I don't think. Oh, that game's got a good soundtrack. I don't have time for that. It's the Amanda Show soundtrack. 
I don't actually remember the show from. Isn't that the? It's a Nick show from like the ni- the late nineties, yeah, early two thousands. All that. That's from the all that era. Yeah, yeah, all that era. Yeah. The, yeah. Th- the end theme song to the Amanda Show is just a reused <laughs> Spyro. <song>. Spyro. <laughs> yeah. Now, if it's a game like The Last of Us or something, I play with the audio on the TV, or occasionally I put on headphones. To answer his question, because I have my headphones here, I have Sennheiser HD 280 Pros. These were expensive, but I really like them for music and for editing, and I have Bose speakers for music. I don't know. I just, game music, like, games are so long and so involved now that I'm just like, I gotta, like, multitask. I gotta listen to this podcast and do fair, something man. else in my fucking life. I, yeah, I, I like it a lot. Like, very rarely do I do that anymore, but I used to like it a lot, and I appreciate game, really good audio design. But with TVs nowadays, you can you can get really good sound out of, out of a TV. Definitely. It's not like back in the day where it, it sounded like somebody dropped an iPhone into a tin can and started playing Living La Vida Loca at like a weird ass frequency. It's like, you know, that's a very specific a- example, but it, yeah. I for, for some reason remember this happening. Ricky Martin, man. I loved that song. Rest in peace. Is he dead? No. Oh, all right. Well, fair enough. <laughs> Daniel Pineda wrote in and said, hey, guys. This one is kind of a random question, but what the hell happened with the Parasite Eve brand and franchise? Those are pretty good games, or do I remember incorrectly? What are your thoughts on that franchise? Thanks. Do you have any experience with Parasite Eve? No, I know of it, but that's literally it. I know the name. So Parasite Eve is a Square Soft game, before Square Soft and Enix merged into Square Enix. Came out in the fall of 1998. It's a survival horror Japanese role-playing game. Well, it's not really a Japanese role-playing game. It's a role-playing light survival horror game about this cop, this female cop. I think her name is Aya. And there was a sequel in the next year or 2000, I think it came out in 1999, called Parasite Eve 2. And there was a PSP game in 2010 called The Third Birthday, which was technically Parasite Eve 3. It didn't have Parasite Eve's name in it, but it was called The Third Birthday. And that was the last time that we saw the series. I don't know what their plan is for it. It was never that big. It's an IP that they can revisit in the future. But I want to say Parasite Eve 1 and 2 might be available as PS1 Classics on PS3 and Vita, but I'm not sure about that. I think it is. But I liked those games a lot. I remember playing Parasite Eve, the original one, that fall. I was in ninth grade when it came out in 1998. My brother and I were playing it, and I was scared of it. I was, like, horrified. I never really played anything like that before. It was... I'm sure there are games like that since, but horror-driven games were a product of the 32-bit era with Resident Evil and Silent Hill and all those games. We never really played anything like that. We were never able to really get scared... I think the aesthetic of games like Castlevania were really awesome and spooky, but yeah. I remember Parasite being very unsettling. Yeah. Zane Herrera wrote in and said, Hey, Colin and Chris, in last week's podcast, you all mentioned consumers nonchalantly abandoning Xbox at the beginning of the current generation and a similar possible jump between platforms at the beginning of the next generation. Has the advent of a focus on digital not changed this calculus? In the last five years, digital purchase, uh, digital purchases rather, in which Red Dead recently set records, and PS Plus games have embedded consumers in the PlayStation's ecosystem to a degree not seen in previous generations. Combine this with Xbox's diminished mind share and the overwhelming, qu- overwhelming quality of Sony's exclusives, and I'm not so sure consumers will be as willing to make the jump again. It's a similar situation with Android and iPhone. There is quality to be found on both sides, better apps on iPhone, more freedom on Android, but most consumers have long since made up their minds as to which platform they prefer. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. How about you? Yeah, I think that in trophies does uh, change the equation a little bit. But this is why Sony needs a multiplayer game. Because as far as I see it, every single exclusive, I could just keep my PS4. You know what I mean? And play those whenever I want. And them being single player games, probably never going to play them again anyway. So the thing you need is like some kind of multiplayer thing to keep people hooked into the ecosystem during this transition. Because I don't, I just, I don't think a single player game is going to keep people from switching consoles, especially if one is obviously coming out looking better. No, I agree with you. I think that there's, and I think he's right. I think you're both. I just think that, and I, I've considered that, and I've talked about it in the past, but I guess in our previous conversation, our most recent conversation, I just didn't bring I, it up. Which yeah. is, it's true that because of the inevitable backwards compatibility with PS4 and PS5, why would you make that abandonment? as opposed to the previous generation when that wasn't possible. I do wonder if backwards compatibility was a thing on Xbox One from the get-go. I wonder if that would have retained more Xbox players that way or oh, people I'm came sure. back in later. So, you know, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And it's a, it's a totally valid point. But I also think at the end of the day that people's experience in the now is going to be what's most important. And I don't think that yeah. even though we talk about backwards compatibility a great deal, I don't think that it's going to be that relevant to the casual or normal game gamer i just don't know that it's as important to them as it is to us because i don't know that they have a collection of games i don't know that they want to go back they want to play the newest call of duty yeah exactly etc backwards compatibility is very much something that you need as kind of incentive to try something new like if if you're gonna buy a ps5 you want to know that it's going to be able to play your ps4 games because that's just a safer bet for you 
that's just a, a better investment because it means that all the stuff that you've bought over time isn't it isn't wasted. It's not something that matters a great deal once the console is out and once people are already on that platform, but it helps people get in without feeling like they're losing a lot. For sure. Good question and good answer. Dobra Baganja. I'm sorry if I butchered that or if you're convincing me to say something terrible and I don't know <laughs> in another language. Dear CNC, with all the production for PS Vita stopping next year and Sony going dark likely until PSX 2019, where will they undoubtedly talk about the debut of PS5? I mean, PS5. I mean, he says PSV. Oops, I mean the PS5. What is the chance they also debut a Vita successor that integrates with the PS5, giving it the mobile capabilities to compete with Nintendo in the Japanese market? Sort of like the Vita was supposed to with the PS4, but this time they roll out concurrently or at least the base system first rather than mobile components first. I think that this is probably a pipe dream. <laughs> as much as I would love for this to happen, I just can't imagine that Sony's really going to do what's most logical and would be most interesting for their ecosystem. I really don't think they have any interest in competing with Nintendo. Yeah. And I'm puzzled by that. I don't think they're puzzled. I, by I, it. I, well, I think they've just shown themselves to be very, very successful in these last five years. And I just don't think they want to shake things up too much. I think that's probably what it is, just like a better safe than sorry kind of deal. For sure. Although I do wonder. If with the success of Switch, if they went back and said, like, hmm, this is something we should at least consider, you know, they're always R&Ding things and testing things out over there, always. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if they've had serious and deep discussions about a PlayStation Vita successor or what we really should say is a third PlayStation handheld. It confuses the hell out of me that, like, more people haven't actually tried to compete on Nintendo's handheld market. Me too. That confuses the hell out of me. I'm confused by it, too, simply because why would you as a, a corporation, a market competitor, why would you just cede that entire hill to them? You, you can't play there? PSP was a huge success. You can play there. You know what to do. I, I just don't know. I, but I think the big problem is that PS5 is going to be so powerful. PS4 is way more powerful than Switch. So PS5 is going to be more powerful, much more powerful than PS4. How do you make that into a handheld that is not $1,000? You know? I think that that's going to be the major problem for them. But we'll see. Final question, Chris, comes from Adam Romano, who wrote in and said, Hey, Colin and Chris, do you think we'll ever see the Jet Moto series again? I know 989 Studios is long defunct, but given all of the classic PlayStation games like Crash, Spyro, and Medieval getting remakes from other studios than the ones we originally who then from the ones who originally developed them, I think now would be a great time for the, its return. Unless there was an entry I missed, the last one was Jet Moto 3 way back on PS1, and the franchise is conspicuously absent from the PlayStation Classics roster. Do you remember Jet Moto? Vaguely. So, and I think that's probably why it's a bit of a <clears throat> pipe dream. Jet Moto was made by a studio called Single Track. And Single Track later dissolved, and in the early 2000s, its remnants became what was called Incognito Software. Incognito, of course, was the studio that gave us Warhawk, the remade Warhawk and all that kind of stuff, and was actually a Sony first-party studio. A studio called, and I've written it down here because I forgot about this, Pacific Coast Power and Light made the third Jet Moto game, and they dissolved. They turned into locomotive games, and they dissolved later on as well. But Jet Moto, there were three Jet Moto games, and you're right. The last Jet Moto game was on PS1 in 99. The first Jet Moto came out in 96. Its sequel came out in 97. Interesting thing is that there was a Jet Moto game in development for PS2, and there was some footage of it shown, and it was canceled in the early aughts. I don't know why we've never seen Jet Moto again. It was clearly popular enough to get two sequels, at a time where not everything was getting sequels, there was a lot of sequelization on PS1, but clearly there were people playing Jet Moto. I played, I had Jet Moto too. And I don't know if there's really a market for that kind of stuff anymore. It seems like the thing of the late 90s. I think a reason that you're probably not going to see it on PlayStation Classics or you're probably not going to see a remaster anytime soon is because the things that we've seen remasters of have particularly distinct mascots. And I think that plays a lot into it. Like people aren't really going to, oh, that's the jet ski from... Jet Moto. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it. He should have been PlayStation All Stars. I don't know if it really carries as much weight as like Spyro the Dragon or Crash Bandicoot or even even Medieval uh, Sir Daniel Fortescue, who isn't even particularly that popular, but he's a character who has a distinct aesthetic. Whereas Jet Moto is ultimately just a Kawasaki. It, it'd be, it, it would be like a re, yeah. It, it would be like a remaster of Gran Turismo, in a way. You know what I mean? It just feels like I don't know if that could even really happen. Yeah, you just got to move on. It is interesting, though. Jet Moto is one of those dormant franchises. I mean, yeah. I'd be cool with... to see a new Wave Race arcade game. Yeah, that would be cool. I think that the big thing that we're missing, you know, and I've said this many times before, the one dormant PlayStation IP that I'm shocked, just totally shocked, has been dormant for 20 years or almost 20 years is, is Colony Wars. I don't understand where the fuck that series went. That was so weird that that series just never came back. That was 
you know, fun stuff and interesting stuff. You know, space shooter kind of stuff. I think it would be great on PSVR. I'm still sad about, uh, what is it, Legacy of Kane. I feel like that could live again. We'll see. Yeah. Soul Reaver was good, and you should all play it. Chris, that's all I have for this week. Yeah, it's a light week, but we I think we made uh, pretty good use of it. Yeah, the E3 news I obviously was the big news. Things yeah. are going to start slowing down, but obviously we're going to keep coming every week with a new show, so no worries there. We will never miss a week. We made a good call keeping that E3 story for this. Yeah, I think so too. Otherwise, we would have had like a 10-minute episode, so that wouldn't have been very fun. Yeah. But we hope you enjoyed it, and remember, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. If you want ad-free early access to every episode of this show, the ability to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas, exclusive podcasts, exclusive Q&As, etc. Of course, that support is essential for us to keep going, but you don't have to support us there. If you listen to us on free feeds, please leave us nice reviews and tell your friends about our show so that we can continue to expand the reach, the might and the majesty, indeed, indeed. of Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. Chris? Thank you for your time. I'll see you next week. Of course. Thank you all out there for listening to us, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is fan-supported over at patreon.com slash Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity. Sean Battershaw, Martin Beck, Fred Bentz, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, David Blodel, Mark Boggio, Spencer Brand, Isaac Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Matthew Brousseau, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Dylan Burns, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Will Caldwell, Luis Cancato, William O'Carroll, Matthew Carter, Brian Chan, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, Kenneth Char, David Chestnut, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Cutter Crow, Nick Cummings, Daniel Diamore, Daniel Delanikos, Travis Depew, Mitchell Durkash, David Ellis, Albert Escobar, Brian Fink, Joe Finelli, Eric Finkenbeiner, Stefano Fontana, Photos Frangos, Connor Gagian, Alexander Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem Al Ghanem, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, Josh Gravelick, Ryan Greenwood, Miranda Grubba, Andres Guzman, Tyler Harris, Nathan J. Henry, Wyatt Henry, Asa Haas, Zan Isa El Ricey, Josh Yeager, Paul Joyce, Greg Julifs, Jeremy Key, James Kinslow III, Ryan R. Kitredge, Taylor Christian Laudrin, Christian Larson, Donald Laws, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Ashlyn Lee, Anthony Lencioni, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Mark Liberto, Aaron Litwiller, Lou and Ray Loper, Colin Love, Josh M, Kiet Mai, Ryan T. Mandel, Peter Mark, Joe McPartland, Wyatt McVeigh, Dennis Meinchin, Andrew Mendoza, Albert Miranda, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Brian Nietzsche, Josh Netzel, Jonah Newman, Adam Nix, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Todd Paxton, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, James Perone, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Matthew Plaster, Lawrence F. Prokop, Eric R. Pryor, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Jonathan Rice, Toby D. Riemenschneider, Austin Riley, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, Matthew Savoy, Hans Schierenberger, John Schultz, Chris Schaefer, Michael Shanholtz, Toby Schutman, Joshua Smallwood, John Tabanillo, Ahmad Tamar, Ben Thompson, Carl Tallman, Gabble Toombs, Tam Tran, Dan Vale, Adam Van Curen, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Dade Michael Edward Went, Mike Wayne, Tyler Woodall, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zaniga, Random Guy Radio, Mad Mock Media, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Throw7, Infinite, Barrick, Mubarak, Richter86, Dav9834, Donk2015, and Gavin.